Thank you everyone for joining us today. You can subscribe to the uh, YouTube channel for VIF, where you can see interviews like this and also what's coming up year round. This podcast was recorded on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. We want to thank the nations for their stewardship of the land and for allowing us to have all of these experiences today. My name is Christian Diaz Duran. I am the editor of the film Les Filles du Roi, Daughters of the King, uh, which also played at VIF 2023. And with me, I have the privilege of talking with director, writer, composer, and the executive producer of the film, Le Fille du Roi, Corey Payette. Hi. Madame Savoie told the girls that they were here to save you. Save me? They don't even know me. Winter is days away. No one will wage war in winter. We've talked so much about the film up until this point. It's been almost two years, I think. And I think Biff has given us this opportunity to keep on going after the film has been playing at so many, um, so many festivals around the, the world, but also locally. I know that you've done a couple of interviews about the film, but I would really love to go a little bit deeper into what it has meant for you as a first time filmmaker in, in fiction and with a film of such a big scope to have this project out. And now just looking back into the process, why don't you take us through who the characters are for people who haven't seen the film and, and what the story is about, your elevator pitch, if you will. Uh, well, it's about Gederli. So Gederli is a young uh, Ghanaian uh girl. Uh, she's basically on a journey to the fort with her brother. She's helping Jean-Baptiste uh, to go. He's a traitor. And so she goes with him to what is then called Ville-Marie. Uh, and when they arrive there on the shores, they see this giant ship arrive with the Les Filles du Roi, who are the daughters of the king, who are, you know, sent by uh, the the Sun King, you know, uh, to populate the New World. And so the whole story, basically, it takes place over a year, and it follows these three characters as they, they you know, create unlikely friendships, but also um, really help to understand for Marie-Jeanne, who's one of the, the women that they meet from, uh, from this ship, really how it is that she survived you know, and so much of the history uh, has been told from the male perspective. In fact, a lot of a lot of uh, the accounts like from the the feeds roi that we were able to to find in the history books were of the men sharing the women's story. Mm -hmm. You know, it was never really I think there was one letter that we found from uh, a feeds roi who had sent a letter back to her son in France. So it was a very uh, interesting process of how do we uncover this story? How do we share this story in a way uh, that hasn't been told before? They're in ceremony. I told them to stay by my side. You told me to watch. I'm watching. So like I said in the beginning, I am the editor of the film, which meant that I came in uh, towards the end of a very long process because this film has been with you uh, for quite some time, with you and with uh, Julie as well. Walk us through what was that first idea that brought Le Fille du Roi as a story, as a concept to you? Well, it started with Julie. So Julie McIsaac, who is the co-writer and also co-lyricist and also plays Marie-Jeanne in, in Les Filles du Roi. Mm -hmm. uh, so she was approached uh, by Fugue Theatre, a company in the city here, to write a, a new musical. And she had this idea about writing a, a new musical about Les Filles du Roi, but from the perspective of these women. She approached me as a composer, just to come in as someone to write music for it. Um, and when we first started talking, it became very clear to us that we couldn't solely uh, feminize the story, that we also wanted to indigenize it. So that really started us on a journey of a lot of research, of going back to 
Aquasusne, which is a, a reserve that borders New York State, Ontario, and Quebec, and start basically a multi-year collaboration with the community, language speakers, elders, um, knowledge holders, cultural consultants from the community to really help us to make sure that the story that we were telling was reflective of a broader history that hadn't properly been understood. Mm -hmm. So then when she comes uh, to you with this approach and this idea that she has, and then all of these things start showing up as the, as the uh, project evolves, what would you say was the first thing that you had to figure out? Is it, is it the music for you or is it the research into the history about to see what these characters are going to be? Yeah, well, what happened was is we had really dedicated time to develop the story, to do the research. And then once the script started and we had an idea of who these characters were and the kind of story that we were going to be writing, then I could start to do some of my thematic writing, um, you know, writing themes that would correspond with each character and then started doing the kind of writing that that basically creates a musical identity for the show so uh that started i remember the first thing that i wrote for les filles du roi and that's this like rolling pattern the like like that sort of like rolling pattern that opens the film i remember that being one of the first things that I wrote and it immediately evoked for me the the feeling of like flying over the land you know sort of this like so uh, really it's kind of funny because then we get that shot in the film of Les Filles du Roi but it's like that is so many years later but when I first wrote that theme that's what I saw was this like flying shot over just trees and forests that go on forever right like anyone who's who's traveled around rural uh you know Turtle Island just knows that that feeling of expansive, you know, forests and, and fields that go on forever. And I felt like I wanted to write music that, for me, uh, captured that. What year are we talking about here? I was in okay. like, t like 2013, 2014. So about 10 years that you've been with this mm -hmm. project. See it yeah. evolve. Yeah, and then basically from there, we just we wrote and worked with the community. Uh, so uh, once we got the show to uh, a place where we were, we had songs, we had the story. Then we we took it to uh, the Native North American Traveling College in mm -hmm. Aquasasne, and uh, and worked with a group of of speakers from the community. Of uh, also the the community has different. So some people specialize in speaking, some people specialize in writing, and then also we had elders who helped to to provide us with the cultural um, grounding that we needed. Because basically, when when you're translating English into uh, any indigenous language, it's not like it's just you know chair means chair. You know what I'm saying? There's a whole uh, world view history, future, relationship that is tied to the language. So even uh, 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 how something would be translated isn't necessarily just about it being a thing, but it's about that the history. What are you using that for? What is the familiarity with that to the person who's talking about it? Um, and so it was absolutely fascinating. It was a process of collaboration, of having to really uh, dissect the text and explain that to uh, Yawendas, who was the elder that we worked with, um, to, to really uncover why would the character be saying this. And then the funny part was when, you know, the elder was working, because we then brought the cast to the community, and then the uh, Yawendas worked with the cast to, to teach them the language and talk through, are you saying that correctly? What are ways that, that um, you know, that we can make the language really, really... Um, not just describe what they're saying, but also really bring out so that it, when you hear the the um, Ganyangeha, that it's not something that takes the characters out for a second. It's something that helps you to recognize um, there's a fluidity to how they speak. Um, and so that took a lot of coaching. Mm -hmm. And uh, and even the elder would often kind of give them line readings of like, well, you would say it like this, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's just really, really fun to see. And also completely correct like completely the way that that uh the the mohawk would be spoken so yeah it was really really special and then we we, we produced the the stage production in 2018 at the york theater on commercial drive and 
basically after that point, we had a plan to go on a national tour of uh, with Les Filles du Roi, take the show all across the country and also back to Aquisasne and to, um, you know, the communities that we had worked with to develop the show. Once COVID hit, it became very apparent that we weren't going to be able to tour for a very long time. But we had uh, raised all this money for, for the tour and had all these communities who were hoping to welcome us and and get to participate in this in the sharing of this story. Um, and so instead of disappointing them, we basically turned to our funders and said, okay, well, we still want to use this money to further the story and to further the reach of the story. And so can we adapt it into a feature film? Mm-hmm. And that was basically how how this happened. And then it kind of, I think once once the team was formed and we started working with some really extraordinary, uh, you know, cinematographers, editors, uh, production designers, uh, all people who really specialized in film, it became apparent very quickly that this was going to be much larger than what we had anticipated. So in your research, um, did you find that to be quite different uh, in the history of Indigenous peoples, looking at creating and, and building a character like Hatter Lee and Jean-Baptiste, was that a stark difference from what a field of Roi would have been treated during that time? Uh, did you find that to be something that they clashed on, that they didn't see women the same way? Absolutely. That was that was a huge, a huge turning point for us in, in recognizing that within um, uh, Ganyangahaga communities, that the women were leaders. You know, they had a clan mother and that and the clan mother would decide what what was going on in the community, who the chief was and and really provide so much leadership that we felt was such a great contrast to the the history of Les Filles du Roi, you know, to these women being sent over and really having to struggle for survival the whole every step of the way. So it it really helped to set the framework for. Uh, what could have been, you know, if uh, we hadn't really kind of embraced the colonial mindset, but instead had had embraced indigenous worldviews and different ways of, of being with the land. Um, and I think a lot of people are coming to understand that now uh, and see the difference. But I feel like that's a story that I really wish had been more widely shared when I was a kid you know, that that there was an alternative and that that alternative wasn't chosen, you know. Mm-hmm. And then beyond that, I also would say that both Julie and I, because it's a musical and because it's, it's you know, they speak very much like contemporary people, but they're set in, you know, 1665. We always saw this as being through our lens and really trying to not look at this as being like, well, this is what the history is. And so this is what it needed to be. We really tried to, and I think we were able to achieve this through the music, but we tried to really have a point of view of what is the voice that we want to hear? What is their perspective in this moment? And what as, as artists and as storytellers do we want to heighten, you know, and really see ourselves as being active participants in that instead of just accepting the history as what it was told as you know what i mean yeah. um and because obviously when that history was told that whoever wrote that had a specific framework and had a specific idea of what they were sharing or what they weren't sharing and so we kind of put ourselves in that position as well and i think that really um definitely informed how we told the story and which characters we would focus on right i think you're also talking about like the difference between what you were taking from historical accuracy into fiction, because as you were saying, it's a, it's a musical. So mm-hmm. I do think we have to talk um, about all the components of this film because it's it's quite it became quite a a massive project, I would say, in terms of what you would expect to to see as a first time filmmaker. And it, not only is a full feature film, but it's also as a musical and language plays such a important part on the film. And I just wanted to. Uh, to ask you about the the importance of of language, the way that you were describing it. So you were talking and working with indigenous elders in more like technical way so that they would uh, check the actors to see if they were saying things correctly or finding the words that would close that would be the closest to what the English translation was. 
but I, I would like you to talk a little bit about the importance of also having them be part of the story and, and what that brought to you, um, especially now that you're talking about all the research and, and finding ways to have more indigenous stories and more indigenous um, lived in uh, experiences as part of the story. So what did it mean for you to have the language and the language uh, carriers be part of the story? Yeah, that's a, a beautiful question. And I think I'll answer it in multiple parts because it's a lot. Go ahead. But I think the first part of it is is that so much of the history, because it's oral history, mm -hmm. um, hasn't been written down. Hasn't been so. So when we went to find all of that history, oftentimes the the accounts were not from indigenous people. They were from anthropologists, or they were from different historians who who went into their study and studying of this history from a very specific lens. And while that was, we, 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 you know, still read it and still took it in, we definitely, we identified gaps, gaps in terms of the women, gaps in terms of, you know, um, cultural significance, uh, linguistic, like history of the region, like all these, all these parts of the, of the story were, were things that we kind of had to, um, we had to think about and dissect where was this information coming from? And then when the information didn't exist, that's when really Julie and I had to had to imagine what that would be or what what we think. Oh, well, I think that if the, they would have done this or we know that they were they were traveling in this way. OK, so let's let's expand upon that from the character's perspective so that we can we can hear it from the indigenous side of what that actually, you know, what they would be experiencing. And then we then took that to the community and then engaged in, we had a reading and, and with the community members and, and talked about the story and, and if it was resonating true and things that were coming up as being like, oh, that, and it was actually really fascinating because there were things that Julie and I had just kind of come up with as, as well, I think this would have happened um, based on sort of the, the Western colonial uh, research that we had from that side. Um, so then we kind of imagined the rest and and remarkably, a lot of a lot of that ended up uh, really resonating with with um, the Ganyangahaga uh, community that we were that we were in, and so that was a, a lovely surprise. But I think that process of sharing, I think, really helped us to feel confident that the story that we were sharing and the perspective that we were trying to, uh, you know, uplift, was one that the community wanted to see and one that they felt they could get behind. And mm -hmm. so that was really exciting. And that I remember that day just feeling, um, you know, like we were doing good work and that this story was one that they that they could get behind. So um, then from there on, I think that really gave us the, you know, a feeling that, OK, well, this now we can start to adapt this. Now we can start to to think about how that story will translate on film, because we didn't just want to put a camera in a in a, you know, a theater. We wanted to really. Uh, reimagine the the production for everything that film does does so wonderfully, and so that means like positioning it in the land and having the land be such a strong presence in the film, um, and also then try to 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 really find a way to have as many indigenous people you know be reflected in the film as possible. So that was really I think uh, when it came down to the way that we were developing it, I think um, for us really made it all worthwhile. And the use of language, I think, is so important. Not only the, the three languages that we hear, but also the main language that you use, which is music, um, as a composer and, and as a, a director of musicals before you made it into film. Um, so I'm going to move on to this language now. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to know um, what is your perspective into understanding film as a way to carry music over um, into the story, how you were able to to manage that. And maybe you can walk us through what that was, what that process was when you were just thinking of this as a stage production. Um, and then what you discovered once you saw it in film and you see all the people reacting to the music specifically. And then I'll keep talking about music. Well, I think I've always, I, uh, musicals have always uh, been what moves me the most. And I think it's because um, when a character can no longer speak, they sing. And that's always been the, the guiding 
point for for my musical writing is really trying to use music as a tool to deepen a character's experience uh, a character who may not be able to share that with others but for some reason in song they have access to to more of their feelings that they can share with an audience and so i feel like that intimacy and that that connecting point through music is has always just been so powerful to me and something that i feel um that I really uh, am kind of obsessed with exploring uh, through through all of my work, you know, regardless of the medium, um, especially as it relates to uh, indigenous experience uh, relating to language, right? Mm-hmm. To indigenous languages that may have been lost, that uh, there's so much of the way that you're told you have to say things, but then this like inner, uh, whether that's an indigenous language or whatever, uh, uh, like your original language in any way that it's like that is so fascinating to experience that through music you mm-hmm. know and we did that in Le Fides Roi, like moments where a character is speaking in well in, you know one song uh where a character is like they're having an argument in French and then the other one of the characters switches to getting in Geha and the other character understands some of it but then is missing other things so they jump back to French and so it's actually using language and using it as a as a tool for the character for the character's argument for the character's experience um and I think music can can do the same thing you know it can it can underlay an emotional quality uh it can it can bring out so much in terms of of uh yeah like the world of of these characters and so that's really exciting to me each of my musicals have a different like tonality so Les Filles de Roi these great big chords uh which people call the O Canada chords um (laughs) but but they're used intentionally uh to basically have it now that I've said that you won't ever be able to hear those chords (laughs) the same way again but it is this like the the opening of the of of the film there's these giant chords and they are kind of a call a call back to O Canada and really it's it's they're used intentional to say uh you know you're going to hear things that are familiar but then you're also going to be challenged through you know all sorts of things and and the music really sets the tone for that um of what you are expecting versus what we're going to give you and to sort of stay open to that and so that's always for me a great way to layer in so many different elements of of, of you know my own vision as an artist uh and my particular point of view through all aspects of of the writing and of the creation that is so interesting uh in the instrumentation of the piece just going back to your first thought of this territory uh in front of you and you can sort of hear uh what the tonality was for Liffy specifically because I, I as you were saying it has tones uh that remind you of older themes in music um how did you manage to create that for such a historical piece but also bringing uh sounds that had to do more with indigenous stories yeah well for uh so for the opening it was very much set up as like a classical musical Mm -hmm. theater opening you know where it's almost these giant trumpets that are like announcing the arrival of les fils de roi yeah and so that's intentional and, and, you know, being very much focused around piano and mm-hmm. the piano chords, that being uh, the, you know, the, the tonality established for the church, the tonality established for like the, the you know, um, settlers arriving uh, and, and setting up, you know, their, their world. And, and then for the indigenous characters, really looking at strings as a way of because what's what's wonderful is within a lot of indigenous music um the it doesn't follow your your tonal scale so it's not like it's it's uh written on on a piano a lot of times like drumming music you know indigenous songs will be kind of uh, between between notes or mm-hmm. in like the the like little uh uh tones that come between two tones on a piano you know or two notes on a piano and so that was really interesting and that's why we chose strings for a lot of the indigenous 
uh, character songs because we wanted them to be able to operate uh, and express themselves within that sort of more fluid tonality. And I think it also kind of, uh, if we use like a, a, the, the colonial like sort of church side as being this, uh, you know, piano, it's tonal, it's, it's strong and forceful. Mm -hmm. And then we have the other side that is strings, sort of more fluid, uh, and also characters who are not as forceful onto the other, you know, uh, who are more so kind of sitting back and observing and trying to take in to make thoughtful decisions. Um, for me, using those those uh, differences in tonality really helped to support the characters' relationships and the journeys that they were on within the story. And also, I wanted, while we are talking about music, I wanted to ask you about your use of a choir figure basically throughout the story, um, uh, which is the, the characters of Lefi. When it's time for, to, uh, for us to hear music and for us to get immersed into a song, they sometimes are the, the, the first voices that we hear and the people that take us through what the song is going to be. I'm thinking specifically for the winter song, and they tell you with their voices that the tone has changed in the story and also in the song. Well, I think the 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 use of them is is to have this unified sort of choral female voice be what is taking us through all of these four seasons. So if you notice those those voices come back at different points throughout the 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 film and and each time they have a different color, a different texture, a different uh, tonality that they're going through that really helps to set the tone for the season, for what they're experiencing. Like even when you look at the end of the film and it's sort of this like sense of renewal and it's moving quick and it's like the women are all singing together. It really helps to um, both in terms of the story that we're telling, but also through that chorus sound being all women really helps to have it be uh, grounded that women are driving the story and that they're the perspectives that we're needing to hear in this. Um, and also, uh, further to that, is just that I think what's wonderful about, about that kind of uh, composition is just that it can be inserted into all these different places and ha hold so much more meaning, right? I think about that, that song in particular and those different um, motifs that the women sing as being it could be sung in any way. It could be sung as like they're doing housework. You know, they're just like cleaning up or they're getting food ready and they're singing this under their breath. And so that's kind of where I was thinking about it is it not being this exceptional song that they're like singing on the edge of a mountain, but really uh, keeping the community moving in all these uh, wonderfully ordinary ways, but populating it with their experience with like everything they've been through and and really looking at that that ordinary being exceptional and being the kind of story that we need to understand today. I can't ask you about music and musicals without inspecting some of your preferred <laughs> musicals and your just sort of your influence, maybe not for Lefi specifically, but in general, if you can give us some examples of of your favorite musicals or the kind of music that you like to hear that inspires you. Wow. Well, I would say that, well, my favorite musicals are Stephen Sondheim. So those are what I, uh, what sort of hooked me as a young writer uh, in university wanting to write musicals. Uh, because this is really a dream come true to get to be doing what I'm doing and sharing musicals in this way. It's like kind of never imagined that that would, that that would happen. Um, and so I would say musicals like West Side Story have been a big influence. Um, Company, uh, Sunday in the Park with George, um, but also newer musicals like The Last Five Years. But it even comes down to like ones like Legally Blonde that are just like really well-written musicals, yeah. you know, and have a lot of, it's, they're doing what I'm doing. They're just doing it in a bubblegum sort of 
poppy sort of way, which is great, but we're all kind of, we're all using the same tricks. We're all like a, a, a well-structured, well-crafted musical all uses the same, the same tools, right? We're all learning from the masters, you know, we're learning from Sondheim, we're learning from Bernstein, we're learning from Rogers and Hammerstein. So it's, it's, it's a, a process of, of really, uh, study right mm-hmm. studying these greats and then seeing how they apply to to your to your writing um and so Leafy, i can't think specifically like i don't think that i had any specific musicals that i was looking to uh, certainly not with the trilingual aspect i think that's just me being extra but um, <laughs> i don't know like and even in terms of the structuring of it i'm just trying to think if there's other ones that are like that sort of year motif you know, summer, uh, fall, winter, spring. I don't, I don't know of other musicals that, that have done that kind of thing. Um, but I think what, what, is, what is great about it for me is that when you think of winter, if, you, if I were to say, like, what does that sound like? You know, wind. Well, that wind has a sound. There's a tonality to that. And so we use so much of that, even just summer, like, of, like birds chirping or, you know, um, it's, it's, each of those time frames, we're really capitalizing on what is that sound and what is that feeling, and then from there, music comes. Um, and so that for me, you know, but I but I didn't create that. I'm not like that's not something that I'm I'm coming up with. Those those are the techniques of the greats. You know, those are the techniques of people who have been writing musicals for much longer than me, that I've been able to learn from over the years, just from studying their from studying their writing, you know, and knowing that that's what they're looking for, you know, I'm just doing it in a different way that's, that's rooted in this place, Mm -hmm. you know. One of the things that I found so interesting going through, just personally going through this process, is the power that music has. It just allowed me to learn words that I've never heard before, and it, it helped me get them into my psyche. But I was wondering if that is something that you are aware of when you're putting something out there and you're pushing language through music. Is it something that you are expecting people to 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 hold in terms of the languages that they know already, French and lang- and, and English, but also this new language being uh, presented to to people in music? Because I I find it such a such an effective way to share a message and a knowledge. That's so beautiful. Uh, it's, I cannot, I wish that I could say that I went into it with this like great master plan. Mm. I think that it just came out of that same question of, well, if we're having some of these characters speak English and French, then what about the indigenous characters? Mm-hmm. Well, what would they be speaking? They would be speaking Ghani and Geha. And so it really is following that thread to find the truth of a character and that that, that truth aligns with their experience, with their language, with their worldview, with their culture. And so in order to make that truthful, you kind of have to do that or you have to go there. So for me, the show could never have been done without Gani and Geha, just as the show could have never been done without French um, or English. And so I think it's about really searching for that truth within the character's experience and recognizing that language holds so much of that. Uh, then beyond that is recognizing that uh, the community has been working very hard to make it possible for something like this to happen. So Akwesasne in the Native North American Traveling College, they uh, won an award in 1992, uh, basically honoring them for for being a community that was holding on to their language because they had a a thing in place where every time a, a speaker passed away, a young person picked up the language. And so since 1992, they have never, their numbers for speakers have never gone down. And, you know, we hear about, oh, indigenous languages dying all over the world and, and, and how devastating that is. But I said, well, what about the ones who are, who are doing great work and who are actually actively holding on to their language and passing that on to next generations? And so I felt like that's what Akwesasne is doing. That's what this community has dedicated to for some of them, like their whole lives, they've been working towards this. And I think that's something that needs to be celebrated and mm-hmm. needs to be understood. And part of Les Filles de Roi, 
uh, was was being able to share that and being able to share the good work that was being done in the community and how we can be a part of of really getting the word out there about about indigenous languages not being gone mm-hmm. and indigenous people not being gone and that we're all still here uh, and that we have our languages to turn to and our culture to turn to because of the hard work of so many people uh, in community. So that's why, <laughs> that's, you know, that's why, that's why, that's why that was so important to do. Yatina, Anska, eh. Tuk ni gun? Tuk ni gun. Yo, yo na did you at any point feel any pressure, though, of knowing how delicate this balance is between sharing knowledge and then all of a sudden the tools that you have would help not only you to present this story, but people who are listening to the language be reproduced this way? Mm. Do you feel any pressure at all? or Do you feel like that is something that was ever presented to you? Yeah, like I feel pressure all the time about a ton of different things. I think it's it's mm-hmm. it's hard. It is it's hard to tell stories and to know your blind spots. Yeah. Um, and so all I can say is that it's, it's for me based on relationships and based on knowing the people in the community and, and, and feeling that I'm asking the right questions and that I'm going about things in the right way, like following the protocols that I've been taught um, and really also coming to the table very transparently. Like I think in, in the same way that we've talked and I talked to everyone who works with me, about about why it is that we're doing this work. I, there's nothing different in terms of my approach with community. Mm-hmm. And I think being that transparent and sharing about why it's important and my background, where I'm from, and and my role as an artist and storyteller in in making space for these stories and having this creation be there where this is accessible and it's in a musical form, that means that so many more people well there might be people who don't watch it because they don't like musicals but for the people who do there's an audience for it and there's an appetite for it and i think um that that i've always known that that's that's been a part of what i'm what i'm here to do Mm -hmm. is to insert those stories into spaces that they haven't existed before uh, and to do it in a good way that is in line with the community that that you know there's been a collaboration in place we're making space for these stories that haven't had that kind of opportunity before. And then the other thing is people love musicals. Like, and I think people love them in a way that um, it's tied to tradition. Musicals are tied to tradition in a way. And that so often people are looking for these stories and looking for alternatives to some of the classics that have been, you know, proven to be problematic in different ways. Uh, and so this is a bit of an offering for a new way to understand uh, and to experience Indigenous people being reflected on screen, especially in musicals. Mm-hmm. Um, and then even further to that is when you relate it to Indigenous culture, um, what I've been taught is that you cannot tell a story without that story having a song and without that song having a dance and that dance telling a story. And so in terms of indigenous culture and how and how uh, the creation and sharing of those stories works, musicals are actually not that far removed from the practice of of cultural songs and dances that that you know that I've been taught. So it it feels like a very natural form for these stories to exist within. And the other thing is that indigenous people we found have responded so strongly to to these shows. So we just got back from from Flathead, the uh, festival that took place in Montana, and a huge number of Native American people got to see the film and responded so so positively and strongly to it. And it was such a great balance to I think what is often a very a very harsh and very one sided depiction of Indigenous people, especially in rural America.
Perfect. I think that's a, a great segue into the other type of language that you're using here, the cinematic language, and mm. uh, something that you have uh, wholeheartedly used in this film. Because I think probably the music at certain points is the most traditional thing that the film has. But in terms of its story and scope, there's, there's many things that are non-traditional. And I think mostly about us being taken back into, I guess, the core performance and, and the core nature of the piece, which is uh, an ensemble of actors working together from the theater into the screen. So the film at various times goes back to that world, to a different world where we find ourselves in a, in a soundstage, in, in a theater environment, in sort of like another uh, state of mind that takes us out of the land and into this world of song mostly, but it's also hardcore memories and, and, and dance mm -hmm. and, and performances, thinking about taking the story into the film and what you were envisioning for the language of the film to be for this crossover between reality and this absence of reality, but living in that musical environment. When we were going about adapting the film, we knew that we wanted to sort of have a you know, tipping of the hat or a nod to the, to the theater form, right? That we wanted to have moments that, uh, because, because the stage show is very theatrical, characters transforming in front of your eyes and, and playing all different characters. So the, the women in the piece all played soldiers, sailors, you know, everyone. Every, the women played all, all the roles. And so we wanted to find a way on film to celebrate that and to and have a different way of of reflecting that and so that's how that's what that's where we started from uh when we were establishing this uh you know theater space that really acts as an opportunity to experience characters dreams uh flashbacks flash forwards you know their their uh worries and their um anxieties and to really once again in the same way that I was talking about music furthering the, going into the characters you know the deep part of their soul that's what those theatrical spaces offered us is that we don't have to take it literally we don't have to literally see these these women go through this horrific passage uh, across the Atlantic Ocean but we get glimpses of it as, as our memories often do, right? Just when you have a flash of something, when you're on a walk and you think back to like a moment in your childhood and you're like, what was that about? These women had those same experiences. These women had those same flashes and same like, you know, moments of memory that we could use that theatrical space to help realize. Um, and so that was always really exciting to us. Uh, and I think it proved as an enormous opportunity to take audiences out of, of the thought that everything that you see is exactly like the literal thing that it was. And what's been so surprising to us is that audiences totally get it. Like it's not something like it's not something that's confusing to audiences. That those are the parts that resonate with people the most. And I think it's because it is that we're we're following the character's journey. It's it's their imagination. It's their memory. Um, it's their dreams. And that's always what we wanted to highlight in this film is really understanding the heart and soul of these women. And so mm -hmm. that's the way that we were able to accomplish that. So we go back to this phase whenever uh, there's a musical number, but we also go back in the film when things take a big turn and we see all of these characters um, having these scenes all together. They're, they're in the same space, but people and the audience understand that they're not um, with each other. Mm -hmm. When you were envisioning that moment, I wonder what gave you the right <laughs> to take such a risk. What made you think that uh, there is language out there that allows you to take a risk with a film like this instead of going in a more, um, I guess, conventional way of telling your story? What gave you the right? That's hilarious. I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. And and I and I would I would like to say that it's you know that I just had this vision from the beginning and everything was fine. No, like I doubted I doubted it throughout the whole process. You know, if if it was the right move, if it would resonate, if 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 it would take people out, and then all of a sudden they they would not be able to like believe the story in the same way. Um, so I had doubts. I had doubts about it. 
what I know is that when you come to a project with a great deal of vision for how you want to realize something and a true uh, artistic motivation for making those choices, people really move mountains to realize that for you. So in terms of like, where did I you know, get the right? I think that I was given that by having really exceptional collaborators who heard what I was saying and then said, OK, let's let's like go for it. Mm -hmm. You know, and I and I think about this a lot about the the freedom that I'm afforded by doing these productions in a sort of indie bootstrap, just like make it happen way that I don't have a studio or I don't have these big you know, companies saying like, you have to do it this way or looking at the dailies and saying, oh, well, this doesn't make sense. Like, I don't know how you're going to cut this together and that I can really just live in this place of discovery trying to put out those ideas and not need to explain it or defend it to anyone and that it's just the way that I imagined it and that we were all putting it together and that we can then discover it together like we did when we were working on the edit and and seeing okay well in order for this leap to be clear we need to we need to start to use these conventions right of mm -hmm. different ways of cutting between shots that help to to give the audience a hint of, oh, we're going into a new place mm -hmm. or we're, we're trying to stretch you a little bit here. And I think what I've discovered from that is just that audiences really love that. And, uh, and so I'm so happy to be able to contribute to that and to be able to sort of push audiences to say like, not everything that is on screen is always like so literal, but that we're asking you to dream. We're asking you to fill in those gaps um, and create the world for these women's stories. Um, and so, yeah, so it's just been really, really fulfilling in that way. This dirty city sewer game. You spoke a little bit about the production aspect of the film, so maybe we can, uh, because I know that there's a lot of people who will make film here in the city but are also uh, going to the festivals where Liffy would be playing and they're wondering like how you can create that on your own merit as you were describing. So I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that production process when you found yourself saying, okay, we can't tour anymore with our live uh, performance and we're pivoting into film. Well, it, would, it was such a huge journey. Mm -hmm. And I think at every step of the way, it just grew and grew and grew and grew and grew un until basically like we were, you know, uh, a pretty big production. Like mm -hmm. we were a pretty for indie for indie film in Vancouver. We were we were like a good team. We had a huge ambitious uh, schedule and people worked so, so hard. You know, but I, I even as I say that, that's the case with every show that I ever do. Like every show that I've ever done, whether it's theater or film, has always kind of been bigger and more ambitious than we thought it was going to be going into it. I think at the beginning we thought that, well, we, we, we had a presenting date for like six months from the day we went to the first day of principal photography. So obviously we had no idea uh, like how long things would take. But, um, but then we shifted and, you know, we work with partners uh, that believe in the message and story that we're sharing. And so it's not about them saying, well, you owe this to us. And did like, there's never those conversations. And I think it's because people, you know, thankfully understand that there's a bigger uh, story that needs to be told. And there's more space that needs to be created for, you know, indigenous led stories like this that are, you know, including indigenous language that have the women's perspectives in them and that sort of cross the boundaries of theater and film, like all of those things, like people really got behind that and so i think because of that they were able to shift with us as the project grew and as you know it had to be adapted and then beyond that i also think that it's been a huge surprise and and joy to just see how it's been received internationally we weren't expecting it to go to festivals all around the world and uh and that's been really really exciting to see and i learned so much like I feel like Lefi when I watch it I can just see I that I was learning 
And so it was a, just a very expensive university. <laughs> it was like a, As it was they all are. Like, yeah. And, and I also feel like that's that's part of it, you know, and that's <laughs> part of the learning process. And and that was the reason to use the, the, the money that we had raised for the actors, but also for the creative to see like, OK, how do we shift? Mm-hmm. How do we do work in a different way? And so it's all for like it's all for good. Like it's all to get this story out there um, because when we had created this, the alternative was for it to just never happen again. And so much of what we've been hearing is just um, how great it is to be able to share the story more broadly. And for this music and and story and character and everything to just have such a, a longer life. Um, and so, yeah, so it's really been a, a surprising dream, the whole, the whole process. And when you were working with the actors on, on set, having them come from the stage and having that previous knowledge of who the characters are, what the songs are, how to perform this. And I always tell you how, how good of a job they did at every take because they were so lived in. Did you find that the actors having that time on stage really helped your time on set and the way that they have performed these characters? Well, I will say the way that I develop musicals is that I work with a lot of the same actors who I'll audition them very early on. And they'll develop the show over years. So even before the stage production in 2018, those actors had been working with Julie and I since 2014, 2015. So I, both Julie and I were writing for the strengths of the characters. We were, sorry, the strengths of the actors. We were, we were writing like Jean-Baptiste was for race. Race Calvert, when he came in and read for that role back in the day, even though the role didn't have all the songs there yet, didn't have all the scenes, it was like his, like what he brought to that character, we just thought, okay, well, we don't have to look anymore. Like he is this character. The same with, with Caitlin Yacht, who, who plays Getter Lee. Like Caitlin had such a wonderful way of, uh, well, of, of really growing up with this character. You know, they, they were also in uh, Children of God, another musical that I did. And so to see their trajectory with these characters and and how different experiences over the years influenced their playing of these roles uh, was just like such a, a, a wonderful privilege that they brought that to the film. And then, of course, Julie is uh, one of the best actors that I've ever seen, like point like blank. Like she is absolutely uh, just one of the best because she is so truthful and uh, grounded in everything she does. And a big conversation that we had when we were casting uh, for the stage production uh, is that audiences need to see an actor, a woman, a presence like Julie uh, depicted because it's not something she's putting on. She is that grounded. Like she is this like centered, uh, like you will not you know, push her over. You won't push her aside. Like that is just what she brings to these, to, to the roles that she plays. And so that's an important thing to get to capture. Mm-hmm. So when it came to, to filming it, it was, all of that was still in them. All of that work, all of the work that we had done with, in the community, language speakers, research over so many years, they'd seen their characters blossom over, over that time. And so all of that was present with us on day one. And I sort of thought that maybe there would be a, a shift that I would have to do for, for actors to go from the stage to, to film. But, but what I discovered in the process is really that when, when you do the work, when you do the table work, when you do the character work, when you do all of the, that, that work as a director and actor, you know, does to prepare for whether it's theater or film, that that, if it's done right, if you do it like truthfully for the character, it translates. Um, and so that was really exciting to see. And also just to touch on what you were saying before, that consistency is kind of an amazing thing to see because they had played it on stage. They knew the arc. So when we were jumping around filming, they, they could tap into that feeling of what it felt like in that moment in the stage play uh, so fully that like on the first take, it was like a lot of times that was you know, there's the performance, like that is it, yeah. you know, and that's a, a just such an extraordinary thing to see. And also just for myself as a director and as a storyteller and, you know, as a friend, 
it's uh, an extraordinary feeling to get to see people that you have so much respect for just completely thrive in this new medium that none of them had had that much experience yet. Um, and that now we get to share it with so many people. So now that we were talking about the actors and the characters uh, a little bit more, I did want to ask you about Marianne, specifically played by Julie, because um, I do find this character to be the most complex in terms of her development, where she is in the story, where she starts, and where we see her at the end. And also because I find this character to be who's driving the audience into the story to get to know all the things that she also learns about others and herself. Did you find that challenging? How did Julie uh, find that process? And did you have a lot of discussions about where her character would end up? Well, she, when we first started writing it, it wasn't like we thought that it was going to be Julie from the beginning. So we didn't know that. Mm -hmm. um, and w at first we were just writing Maddie Jen and we were, we were co-writers and we had other actors playing the role. And then it really was as we were going into the first stage production that I was like, Julie, you have to play this role. <laughs> it was also just so much about her and uh, that uh, both her acting style like how how absolutely fantastic she is as a performer, but also her voice. Like she has this beautiful, like chanteuse voice, you know, sort of, um, I don't know, like it, ha it has this very um, kind of old, old school quality to it. Like where like people don't sing like that anymore. They don't have that kind of like breathy ease about their voice. And, and so it, it was also that, that I felt like as we were, as we were, writing the the songs together that she would do the demos and then we would get other singers in and they would have a, a different quality to their voice and they're like well that's not my Jean. you know what I mean like that doesn't mm -hmm. quite have the same thing as what as what Julie had brought like a, like for example like having a more musical theater sound for me lost something in the character you know I wanted them to have a like French Canadian folk song the sounding voice you know which is kind of um, um was really very much what I was going for with Marie Jeanne's song. And then for, uh, in terms of just giving Marie-Jeanne all of this agency and all of this sort of drive throughout the story, really that, that, that came so much from wanting to match Getter Lee's energy. We wanted to make sure that Marie-Jeanne wasn't just the, the woman who came over and was married off, you know? Mm -hmm. We wanted to give her, uh, yeah, we wanted to give her something that, why would she come? You know, that, that's a really great first question for, for any <laughs> feeds in a while. Like, why are you going on a, you know, giant journey across the ocean to start a new life? Like, what would, what would make you do that? You know, um, and I think that question sent us on an enormous and, and a very complex journey of why you would pack up all your things and sail around the world um, to then live such a hard life. Uh, and and what your what those expectations were, how did how did those systems fail you, um, and then also where would you find hope? And for Marie Jeanne, that hope lives with the, her friends that she makes, right? That these people, the love that she develops, um, that then they become her family. They become the people she trusts the most, and uh, and that was such a you know in terms of of fundamental sort of. Uh, histories that we were hearing was just so much of you know the the intermingling of french and indigenous communities right that it that well, that was so much a part of that area at the time uh and and continues to be so it's uh so it was something that we knew we wanted to include uh mm -hmm. to really help to to set the scene for for the the sort of uh society and and culture that we have today can you give us some of the factual reasons why these women came um, at the time? And then also I get that response to why, as to why Mary Jenna was coming. In your research, what do you find to be the main reason for 
I don't know if there was a main reason. I think it was a lot of trying to look for a better life. <laughs> it was hard. It was hard in, in France. And it was, uh, you know, opportunities were scarce. And also the Sun King would give you a dowry. So you got all of this. If you agreed to go, you got money, you got like supplies, you got so much. If you if you married, it wasn't just if you went, you had to actually marry someone and then you got your dowry. So it was a huge incentive to start a new life and to go also to go on an adventure. And um, And it was a lot of women who, you know, didn't have a lot in in France and who who wanted something more. And so now what's what's really fascinating is is just how many people are descendants of Defeat mm -hmm. you know, and how these like this group of, uh, you know, uh, under a thousand women, basically, like they really did like they're they, you know, in terms of in the film, we have the populate the new world. It's like it really was, you know, it has had enormous um, impacts on on Turtle Island. Yeah, I, at least for me, I've had my share of people coming in and saying, uh, I am the, a descendant of Le Fille du Roi and I'm going to watch the film because of that. Have you had that same feedback? Yeah, and some have been really good and some have not been good. Because I think what's interesting is that when you're challenging the status quo and mm -hmm. when you are, are challenging the history that's been told, people are coming in expecting it to be Le Fille du Roi you know, in French, the story of the women coming over and populating and populating the new world. And then when they're told this um uh, uh perspective of Gerli and Jean Baptiste, and they're seeing sort of the unraveling of what was promised or that like traditional story that they've been taught their whole lives. Uh like some people have been, have have had have struggled with that. How did you get the name Jean-Baptiste? I don't look like a Jean-Baptiste. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> well, my father was French. He lived with the Ghanaian Gahaga for years, but then he had to go back. He lived with the Ghanaian Gahaga? The Ghanaian Gahaga. Ghanaian Gahaga. Yeah. And he married my mother. French people don't marry Les Sauvages. I didn't know that people did that or were able to do that. We're all just people. And I think that's okay. I think that's part of what we were, what we were doing. And maybe it also helped, you know, some of these, uh, the people who are like real advocates of the French history to sort of uh, maybe think a bit more critically about what would that feel like uh, for Indigenous people, mm -hmm. you know, to see that, the, the narrative is these two dominant cultures, English and French, sort of taking over and everyone forgetting about Indigenous history and Indigenous language. Why are we prioritizing one over the other? Um, so that's been an interesting conversation to have. That's what this uh, film is all about, is of inserting that, that narrative and then having it live with, you know, the histories that, like, we are... That's the other thing, is, like, we've heard it. Like, we've heard that story. Like, we've heard the colonial view. We've heard, we, you know, that story has been in textbooks and has been taught, you know, it was, it was taught to, you know, to us when we were kids. So why would we just share that same story again? Like, is that the most interesting thing to do? Or do we want to maybe understand a, a different perspective? And I think some people are, are up for that and understand that. And then I think other people aren't. Yeah, and I also think that in terms of telling a story, any story, if you present challenges and you present a different perspective to the characters that people may recognize, that makes that character's journey more interesting. Uh, but it also makes them falter, uh, mm -hmm. which is uh, just human behavior. And I think that the challenge that you present to them also comes with letting go of those expectations, wouldn't you say, and being present to think about how uh, these people, they were... Uh, working with their surroundings and with the people that were re uh, already living here. There's also all of these other instances in which she rises to the challenge and her position changes about things, the things that she learns. Mm.
Obviously, this film also played at VIV uh, last year, and that was your first uh, presentation of a film in the Northern Lights, which uh, highlights filmmakers that are local and um, indigenous filmmakers as, as well. Can you just talk us through a little bit about that experience of putting a, uh, an end point to the film, saying, okay, this is ready to go, and then just sharing it? Well, it was it was really it was really great. Like I I um I loved VIF and I've been to VIF and 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 you know been a part of VIF over the years. Um and so I knew that I wanted I I knew that there would be a home for it here. Um but I still like we did the regular submission process. We did all this stuff and like heard, you know, very last minute. And so it was like it 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 was something where we were just as surprised as anyone else. Like we weren't sure if it would, if it would be selected. And so when it was, it just felt really, really great because I know that this community that have, you know, seen the stage play that know my work, Julie's work, the artist's work, um, would be really eager to see what it is that we, that we came up with. So it was, it was great. It was a really great process. And then also just being a part of all the conversations surrounding the festival. So I was, I had the pleasure of sitting on a panel with a number of other uh, feature filmmakers whose films were in the festival, who's, who then I get to watch their films go to other festivals. So that was a big part of it as well, was just the connecting point with mm -hmm. other filmmakers and being seated at that table that I did, I felt like I had no reason to, to be there with, with such experience, you know, uh, that these other filmmakers brought. Um, but, it felt great. Like it was, it was such a great experience. And then the, the other thing of, of it being received at other film festivals is really getting a chance because, because I've seen the film so many times now, <laughs> like now I'm like not really watching it anymore and I'm watching audience reaction. So I'm watching to see like what, what parts of the film are, are people laughing at? Oh my goodness. In Montana, where we just went, they, they flew out me and Julian race. Um, for for the the two screenings at the festival and also for the awards, and they were such a vocal audience. Of course, right? It's a lot of there were a lot of Native American people there. There was a lot of uh, you know ranchers, sort of uh, retired ranchers and uh, people from the community. But the vocal, like how, like huh, like just like cracking up. Like, <laughs> I, was like I did not think that it was that like that it was that funny but but people like all the jokes really landed mm. and it was kind of like a sitcom like it was it was really really funny at some points felt like a laugh track i was like it was really surprising and just the fact that the film brought that kind of uh response out of the audience i just thought wow we've like we have found our you know we found the people that this really really resonates with Trois. 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 You keep practicing. And I, I and I'm not surprised by that because obviously I grew up in a rural place, you know, in northern Ontario, and also Julie grew up in a rural place. So we're coming to our work with that kind of uh, perspective. And so um, and so it was a great reminder of really looking at the different kind of uh, exposure that the film has had. That it's great to bring it to these flashy, glitzy festivals like VIF. But also, there's a great opportunity to have the film be shown to more rural places that may not have access to Indigenous stories, narratives like the one that we're putting out there. Um, and that that kind of appreciation that you get from those smaller places is, um, yeah, it's just, it's really, really beautiful and uh, was kind of a surprise. Would you say that's the guiding force for what's to come uh, for the film in terms of sharing it with more spaces that wouldn't see the film otherwise if you don't reach out if you don't find ways to to get to them yeah well and so at vif we had two screenings and both of them were were super well sold but actually we uh this month have another four four screenings or five screenings at the Kulch in in east van and those are already selling super well so i think it's about it's it's about connecting with the audiences that know the work and know us, but then also making the film accessible to communities that otherwise wouldn't be able to to experience it. So the film's on the TIFF film circuit across Canada, so it's being screened in you know movie theaters all over that have you know film festival series. So it's been something where I honestly didn't expect any of this, and I'm learning so much in the process. The bigger lesson is just that you know. People are looking for these stories. And so, you know, more makes more. And uh, 
and so there's no there's no slowing down. So having gone through this whole process, and as you keep saying, you've been you've learned so much. Is there one thing that you that you're taking with you from this uh, chapter of your life of Lipi Bihua that you're using either professionally or personally? Looking back at that person in 2014, imagining what this project would be until now, what would you say would be the first thing that comes to mind? I just, well, if we're talking about like lessons in filmmaking, I think the thing that I, I, I learned the most in Lefi was to trust the, the people that know more than you, you know, to do their jobs and to do like that, that they know, like trust, trust what they know. Not that I didn't trust, but just that I think that I got in the way a lot. And I think that I needed, I, I made some processes more challenging just because I wasn't familiar with them, right? So that was a huge lesson. Um, and, I, and I feel like I've since gotten a lot better at that. Um, and, and so I think that's been, that's been the biggest lesson and the biggest takeaway. Um, and then in terms of like storytelling, musical, musical storytelling, I think that what I'm most excited for now is to really um, see how far we can push the form and to really, really, I'm just in a mode right now of, of creation of like trying to get out as many stories as possible, uh, to try to reach as far as possible, just because I know that for so many, uh, young indigenous people who don't see themselves reflected or who don't see even their worldview or their history be reflected. I know that these stories are life and death sometimes, you know, that, that, knowing that that people get it or that people see you or that that a new history is being understood gives uh, communities a lot of hope and so I just I feel that urgency so strongly in me and and it so it just keeping me keeping me going um and I think that that's that's the biggest thing that I've learned from sharing AP <laughs> is just how much how much that's needed uh and that it's not like a uh, it has never felt like that it's being pitted against anyone else. It's more that all of those need to be there. All of those voices need to be there because that's the only way that we're ever going to truly, you know, move forward mm -hmm. is by understanding all those different perspectives. And so I'm really proud that Lefi is a part of that, is a part of those different voices being heard. I can't let you go without asking in which spaces do you feel your career will be moving now after this experience? Well, I ultimately at the end of the day, just see myself as a storyteller. And so the medium doesn't really, uh, it definitely informs how I want to share the work, but it, it doesn't uh, dictate the stories that I tell. So the writing stays the same, uh, the, the characters stay the same, the storytelling stays the same, but maybe how I, how I frame that changes you know, based on whether it's for a film or whether it's for uh, the stage. So I'm still doing both. So last year I, I did the stage production of Starwalker and then we turned it into a feature film that is currently, you know, in uh, post-production. And then I also have a number of, of other, you know, stories that are being adapted or that are just being like created from scratch. Um, so I think it's it's more so about finding finding the time, finding the capacity, and also what's been great with with VIF and all these other film festivals is really getting to meet other experienced producers and looking at, okay, well, what are ways that I can scale up the kinds of productions that I'm doing, both for theater and film, um, to really get like the most exceptional quality for, for these stories. Um, so that's what's next. <laughs> Just a little bit. Just a little. But yeah. Well, Corey, thank you so much for thank joining you. me. What an experience to have. Honestly, what an experience to go through this whole process and just to see it through and to be here reminiscing and and I, I, I guess taking uh, accountability for what things that we've learned and the things we're let, yet to learn um, as a filmmaker and as an artist. I think that's such a gift to have. So thank Aww. you. <laughs> Thanks, Krista. Thank you, Corey Payette. <laughs>